Oh, Jeremy Brown is the City of London's special representative to the EU. So uh, Boris saying go whistle, it's not terribly helpful, is it? Well, it's not normal language of diplomacy. I mean, I suppose the British government has to uh, remember that it's acting on behalf of the British taxpayer. There's not a big pot of free money, so we have to negotiate hard on the size of the exit fee. There are some areas where Britain has signed up to obligations where I think there's widespread expectation we will end up paying up. But I suppose, you know, we need to keep the bill as reasonable as we possibly can. But I mean, you're in Brussels, Brussels constantly. The City of London is, is over in Brussels right now looking for special treatment from the EU. I mean, this sort of undiplomatic language is not terribly helpful, is it? Well, I mean, I don't want to be excessively prim about it, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's a good idea to, um, to uh, have some sort of subtlety and dexterity and to think about how some of these comments would be received by people on the other side of the channel. But, but I mean, you were a minister, you'd never <laughs> use language well, like that when you well, were... Well, uh, well uh, I still defer to the Foreign Secretary because I used to be a Foreign Office Minister myself, so... Uh. Oh, we're looking at some <laughs> of the substance of what Boris Johnson said. I mean, he, he said it was uh, vanishingly unlikely that we'd get a cliff edge situation with Brexit, that we wouldn't get any sort of deal. Do you go along with that? No, that's not the wide-held view in the city. I mean, we're going on this timetable to March 2019. We obviously have to negotiate the terms of departure. I think people are fairly confident we can do that as a country. Uh, but there is not a widespread expectation that we will manage to achieve a full future trade relationship between March now and March 2019. So there's a widespread belief that we'll probably need some sort of bridging arrangement to take us from March 2019 for maybe two or possibly three years to get us to a trade agreement by 2021 or 2022. So we're going to need a transitional arrangement. Does, it, does that mean prolonged oversight of parts of the UK for the European Court of Justice? It's a good question. What, I mean, I think for the final deal, uh, we will have to have a what they call third country arrangement. We will be external to the EU. Uh, there is appetite for that in the EU. What there is not appetite for is a separate bespoke deal for the transition. The EU's belief is that the transition will be under the terms, as you say, of the European Court of Justice or be some sort of Norway-style arrangement. It may be possible for Britain to modify that, but I don't think it will be possible for Britain to convince the EU that we will be completely free from all the obligations of being in the single market in terms of regulation, oversight, supervision during that transitional period. Mm -hmm. So we would have to, as a result... Uh, for those who are most anxious about this, put up with two or three years of a sort of uncomfortable status for those who are keenest to leave before we left definitively in 2021 but or 2022. that's one of Theresa May's red lines. I mean, it's going to be pretty explosive, isn't it, with the hardcore Brexit? Well, the British government would like to complete the deal by March 2019. I don't think anybody wants the deal to be later. I just say that I travel very widely in the EU and I've yet to meet anybody who thinks that is a realistic timetable. And there is anxiety... You know, that if we're completely in the EU on the Tuesday and we are completely left on the Wednesday, that that will be very disruptive. And, of course, the other problem is if we don't have some greater expect certainty on this quite soon, people will plan for this hard Brexit disruptive cliff edge in March 2019. And some of the benefits of then having some transitional bridging arrangement will be lost because people will have planned for the worst-case scenario anyway. What did you make of Boris Johnson saying there was no plan for a deal with, or a Brexit with no deal? Because that's... That contradicts what David Davis has been saying. Yeah, and, uh, well, I think we should plan, and the Bank of England are acquiring city businesses to plan on the worst-case scenarios, and they're expected to come up with uh, their reports uh, in the next day or two on, on that, and then there will be further expectations placed on them. So a business is planning on realistic worst-case scenarios, and I suppose the city uh, would expect the government to do that as well. I mean, actually, it's also quite noticeable that the EU... Uh, I think, is uh, not doing sufficient planning on terms of worst-case scenarios at their end, um, in terms of, you know, would Britain not pay an exit fee? What would be the arrangements for citizens and so on and so forth? Now, it may be that they feel they're in a sufficiently strong position, they don't need to do that, but I, I think uh, the ability to plan for the worst is probably a good idea on both sides. Well, you just said worst-case scenarios. I mean, just before we came on air, we've had these comments from J.P. Morgan Chase's CEO, Jamie Dimon. He says EU officials could force London-based firms to move substantially more employees abroad than planned if they demand additional banking operations be performed inside the bloc. I mean, that doesn't sound terribly encouraging. No, there's quite a lot of uh, division of opinion within the EU, even though there is the facade of great unity. Uh, there are some people who see within the EU who see their interests bound up with London continuing to be a strong global centre. There are others in other countries who are keen to try and go a bit more aggressively after London. 
So we will see what the regulations are and what they put in place and how much business they try and drive out of London. I think the big message that we need to try and convey is that London is a European asset. It's not just a British asset. It's a mistake for the EU to measure their success by the degree to which they manage to diminish London. They should see London as part of their success story. Of course there will be some adjustments as a result of Brexit. I don't think anyone pretends that things will be exactly the same. And there will be some opportunities for Frankfurt or Dublin or wherever it may be. But London is the only global scale London, uh, European centre. And the alternative to London being Europe centre is Europe not having a global centre at all. All right, Jeremy Brown, got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me. Thank you.